the audience, let me also inform you the topic uh, of discussion that's taking place over here. It's all about creating a digital thread through your supply chain and use it to drive results and unlock value. So that's going to be the theme for the upcoming panel discussion. And I do hope you've taken a good look at the agenda so that you are at the right track, at the right place, at the right time. Moving forward very quickly, let me invite, firstly, our session moderator. We have with us Mr. Manoj Kothari, Vice President, Supply Chain, Global Demand and Supply Organization, Zydus Wellness Limited. Joining him, may I also please invite our panelists. We have with us Mr. Ankit Bhatt, Chief Strategy Officer, MapMy India. Mr. Samrat Sehgal, Head Supply Chain, Dabur India Limited. We're also joined by Mr. Dharmendra Gangrade, Head Logistics Management Center, Lawson and Tugro Limited. Joining our esteemed panelists on the stage, we also have with us Mr. Sheikh Asad Parvez, Head Logistics and Warehousing, WeGuard Industries Limited. May I also please invite Aniruddha Karnataki, Vice President, Supply Chain, CH Tires Limited, and Mr. Ashit B. Hegde, Managing Director, Asia Pacific, Akiba. So while we are getting them to plug in with the mics, I hope all of our members of the audience are all set for another engaging discussion. And uh, we'll also ensure that we have some time left to take some questions from our members of the audience. So please stay tuned for that. And during the upcoming breaks, I also hope uh, all of you do take some time off to connect with all of our speakers, all the booths that are placed outside to find out more on the upcoming initiatives and latest products, all that and more. So that being said, time to also plug the mic for Mr. Arshit. And while we do that, let me also hand over the proceedings to Mr. Manoj Kothari to set the tone for the discussion and to get it started. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Because the data is not good. 
more than 70% of projects get delayed from the existing timeline is because the data is not good. So the question is, what is good data, right? I mean, ultimately, it is garbage in garbage. I mean, whatever tools you talk about uh, in, 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 this, in, in this era, I mean, whether it's tools that can do AI, ML, or you know, uh, language processing, or you know, uh, any any kind of such, you know, the buzzwords that you hear. If you don't, if, if you do not have a good data, then it's, it's bound to fail. Uh, so I mean, that's why I think one of the things that also people say is uh, data is, is, a, is a new currency for, for supply chain, and uh, they don't need anything because you know, ultimately all, all these projects depend on that. We have, uh, as, as, a, as a tool implementer or a supply chain planning tool company, uh, we can into this data which is almost all, all our projects. You know, there are times when the project's timeline is saying uh, six months. For example, for a demand planning, forecasting, implementation project, the original timeline will be six months. But then it takes about four or five months to get good data. And then there's a whole delay. I mean, this, this happens every, every project. And the main reason for that is, you know, until people go on this digital transformation, uh, whether it's in terms of ERP implementation or your supply chain planning or uh, EMS modules or whatever you call it, people, the, the planners of the, or, or the organization will use only the data that they require. For example, they get the order data, they will try to, you know, uh, convert into the sales, and then that's it. Right? And then maybe a little bit of master data here and there you know, is managed. But when people embark on a journey of this, you know, uh, this new age uh, projects, like you know, whether it's a planning project or like I said, you know, different kind of analytics project, that's when the real uh, essence of data is, is seen. And that's where people don't realize that you know uh, what they've been doing is actually a very, very small percentage of what they can do with with the, with the, with the structured data. And also irrespective of whatever ERP, whether it's SAP, Oracle, QAD, or whatever ERP you use, there's always a challenge. So uh, one of the things that I uh, take away is that you know, any project that you embark on, make sure your data is structured. Make sure that you talk to your implementation partner or, your, or the product company on, on what kind of data is required. So get, I mean, having a very aggressive timeline is good. But unless you have a good structured data that can deliver you some benefits, don't start a, a, a implementation journey. That's my honest um, advice to the team because I've been doing this for the last 16 years and like I said, this is something that we, we get stuck every now and then. Thanks, Ashley. I think uh, once we will have a data and the next challenge is how you uh, we can unify our supply chain and build a network to give a real-time connectivity. So on this, uh, I would like to uh, call Anirudh uh, to talk about the same Anirudh is uh, from again, uh, Seattle and very, very, uh, we would like to see your perspective. Uh, so I think, uh, as rightly said, uh, uh, data is the new currency, I think, and uh, there is no debate about it. Uh, on the specific question, So there is a front end which is largely the sales interfacing, uh, you know, entity processes, etc. There is a middle end and uh, uh, there is a back end, right? That's probably the very immense view of supply chain. So in my view, uh, first of all, what is the real time uh, need of the data? And uh, before, let's say, getting into how do we, how do we sort of unify uh, this or create a structure? I think this definition of real time changes from front end to middle to the back end. I mean, uh, I am sure there is enough experience in this room, uh, uh, which probably all of you can relate to it. 
So the real time for the front end is probably a hourly billing or a daily billing, and you know how do you replenish the uh, stocks? Let's say at your uh, billing points or distributors, etc. Whereas for the middle uh, end of the supply chain, it is maybe more of weekly or monthly uh, RCCP planning uh, or replanning in order to let's say meet your changing you know demand uh, as as you see it uh, from the front end and maybe when you go slightly behind on your inbound side it is probably again uh, monthly or weekly so that's the first paradigm uh, i think we need to keep in mind uh, how do you sort of create systems in my uh, limited experience uh, I, I think uh, most organizations approach it uh, first in a siloed manner and then try to you know uh, build the interconnections. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's say uh, you will probably build a supply chain optimization software or a platform first, which will uh, you know give you the capability to create uh, optimal plans uh, in order to meet your service and cost targets. Somebody else in the company would build a very uh, efficient CRM or a sales interface, which will probably be uh, you know uh, more customer facing and will capture the uh, demand as it should be. Uh, and somewhere else, you would also build, uh, let's say, uh, something on say transportation uh, front, etc., for tracking your goods and uh, a control tower for transportation. So what happens is. Uh, uh, and when we sort of mix these two paradigms of let's say creating the uh, IT or digital platforms and the need of the real time information in different segments of supply chain, uh, I think it's, it, uh, I mean uh, some of you would relate to it that it's a very uh, uh, complex problem and nightmare to sort of you know have interconnections across these three uh, uh, verticals and different systems. Which is what I think most of the supply chain decision making uh, gets uh, impacted and you lose efficiency. So my take on this uh, point at least uh, uh, in, in this uh, first uh, response would be uh, before creating let's say different uh, systems for different parts of the uh, uh, end to end supply chain one should keep that end game in mind and create the solutions uh, which will probably be easy to uh, you know easy to connect to each other and easy to let's say uh, uh, transmit the information from one process to other seamlessly thank you i think uh, uh, you know indicating the entire all the facet of organization the entire towards one end goal uh, you know, taking this one forward and uh, uh, looking from creating an ecosystem, again, going to a real-time connectivity, I would like to invite Sarvatra from LNG to give this question. Uh, made for a uh, 
student level conferences could be any part of the world. So, giving you this background, because then there is a need for the unifying the data. Now, by this, uh, each project as such runs on its own PNL, but also is a part of the large organization and large, large setup where the efficiencies needs to be driven. Because in, in our kind of a business, the cost and schedule is something which drives the profitability. Either you are you miss any of them between the two, you are actually out of your profitability uh, threshold. And that's where the focus comes in tremendous on the data availability because it, what you can see in the logistics in form of data, only you can monitor and control and improve. What you can't see, you just can't. So with the same logic, uh, uh, look at a scenario or situation when we have uh, our global suppliers applying to our uh, the aggregation sites type of application sites like Surat, Azira or uh, Chennai, Katupali, Kuramatur or a couple of other locations within the country. You have multiple suppliers dispatching their goods almost at the same time because many projects are running parallelly towards the uh, end of the port. So, we would like to know that which, which are the countries of the ports where our cargo is being getting fed from the factory to uh, port and from port to uh, towards the India, or any of the port, and then from India, consolidation, etc., and then from there to the respective project sites. Now, if you look at the linear situation only for the uh, unifying it, each one can unify independent company or business units in their own way in the most optimal manner. But when you look at the overall uh, LNT as uh, one conglomerate, which as we all know, it's a uh, close to a 20 million dollar problem, right? So, we need to have a unifying processes also and where optimization is at a LNT level, not as a project level, because then, then only that is the most optimized one, not the sub-optimized one. So, it brings the tremendous importance to a company like us to have the visibility of data from all stakeholders being part of the value chain, right? From a supplier, supplier, then supplier, then my Origin countries, port related, uh, shipping line, train order, airlines, and then we need the price of the entire uh, uh, transit from the anywhere in the world to country or within the country also we have a lot of movement. I am not touching upon anything which is by and large with this room anywhere is very familiar with domestic logistics and transportation. I mean the room is filled with this one, so many experts of the domestic transportation sector. So my focus is mainly right now on the global shipping and no, bringing it because India now becoming a China plus one strategy, part of the China plus one strategy. That brings in a lot of focus on having the visibility of the, your cargo from anywhere in the world to India or output from India to any, many parts of the world. So this is one block where the data unification is lagging behind, it is much below the nascent stage even, it is not even across the nascent stage level and probably requires a lot of uh, uh, tech enablement, uh, collaborative approach from the multiple uh, stakeholders like you have service provider LSPs and then suppliers and, uh, and then the companies like uh, Blue Order, I mean I saw the ad, and Pando and a couple of more who are trying to unify the data from the external stakeholders which is also very very important which probably at times goes beyond the internal stakeholders that is for controlled uh, uh, supply locations the uncontrolled or uncharted supply That's my take on the overall uh, need for unification of the data within the supply chain. Thank you, Dr. I think uh, uh, we see organizations are becoming more and more global uh, in a multi-product, uh, multi-channel environment and uh, uh, you know my perspective here is unifying the data and the real-time data will give not only the visibility but also the single source of truth and uh, that's very important for people can see at the, at the same time in a couple because finally all the data, all the platform, etc. leads to the action or execution. So, uh, supply chains are becoming what I say digital where planning is all about digital, getting the data is all about digital and acting is physical. So still for say, I mean we are a company or the department or what, we have to have our goods available at all the CFA points, distributor points in the MD, e etc. So until unless we will have the same 
source of data, uh, data and say uh, on the same platform simultaneously across all the nodes, we will not able to honor our, our commitment. So, uh, thank you, Dr. I think uh, with this, we will go to the other perspective of uh, from B2B uh, company and a bigger project company to uh, consumer durable company. I will mean, invite Asad to give his uh, you know, kind of reflection on the entire particular journey. Yeah, good afternoon, friends. So, if you see what is supply chain, what we were doing earlier, we were like, earlier doing the flow of material was happening, correct? So from one from manufacturing, we were able to deliver to the customer or the consumer. The flow of material was going through several phases and it was happening. But now after the transition or the world where we are going into the digital world, and in fact, Corona also taught us that we have to be digital and it, it forced us to go digital. So if you see and even if you know that we are already in the Buka world. So here the flow of information is equally important. Flow of goods is going, so parallelly flow of information. So we realize this in our organization. And to overcome this, what we did, see we have the front end plus the back end, and the middle end, like the, what Narendra also said and Arul also said. So we first digitize all the front end side, which is our customer side. So where now we are in a position where we are also getting the data, what my distributor or a dealer is saying. So I'm getting that data. So that makes sense for me. So with that data, I know what I have to produce. Correct. So once I know what is selling or what I have to sell, we are doing going back. So we know what we have to produce. So similarly, that we have linked with the SMOP process. That data is linked with because earlier what was happening in the SMOP process, which was manual kind of a process. That time some forecast we were making and the planning team was sharing this forecast with the sales team. And sales team typically what they will do, they have AOP number. So basis that they will put the forecast. So actual forecast, if you see the accuracy of the forecast, it was coming to around less than 40 percent, which I believe most of you would also be uh, going through it. So getting a very good accuracy in forecast was a big challenge because sales team they have some other agenda. We were uh, uh, publishing for uh, uh, the market was having behaving in its own uh, pattern. So to get that bridge that gap, what we did. We had this SMOP process totally digitized. So where what was happening? Now the sales team, they were doing the forecast. And plus with this system, we were also, which is AI, uh, ML enabled, plus we are having this various algorithms set in the system. So what they were doing, the system was also set, uh, generating some forecast. So all the seasonality factor and everything we had to move, uh, put as algorithm in the system. So now the sales team, they had a reference point. So earlier the reference point was the history, now the reference point was a more intelligent data. So with that data, now they were doing the forecast. And plus we also have the market data, so what is the inventory lying in the dealer distributor point. So that data also we are having. So with that we get the actual, the post this uh, SNOP process when we were doing the MRP run. So that data, that production plan that was getting generated was more realistic. So in that way, our inventory health also started improving because we were not having much redundant inventory. Because now you know you have inventory which is actually going to sell. Other than the inventory with the sales team, they will just take that AOP number, put some number in that and they will give you for production. And you know, uh, I know many sales team would be here, but sales team, they are like, they think that they own the inventory. So their concept is the more inventory I have, I will get more sales. They don't want to lose out. So any inventory if you see, typically if a sales team gets to know that this inventory is out of stock, believe you me, you will get more order of that inventory. And then entire month's target will be put on that inventory that because of this particular SKU, my entire month's target I was not able to achieve. Okay. So that is practically happening in most of the organization. Correct. So we have to now make ourselves as supply chain professional more equipped and come with Challenge their thing that what you are projecting and what the system is projecting or what we are taking data we are so we are marrying all the data in the system. So data is already there. It is not it was not there because post digitization also we were doing business. But now with digitization what we are doing we are trying to collect all this information in buckets. So now I have dealer stock. I have SOP process which is more realistic. So my forecast number and the number that I have got which I have to produce is more realistic. Correct? Now with that data what I have done, now I am doing the MRP planning. So backward integration is happening now. 
with MRP planning, I am creating more realistic number which I have can give to my production team and my sourcing team to produce the correct raw material. So they are also saving money by not buying some unnecessary raw material because sourcing team also they are they are the opposite of the sales team. Same people with different, so they will play more with inventory, FG goods, and sourcing team will play with more of raw material because they also they don't want to take the pay. Correct. They will ensure that they have all the raw material so that production is not getting lost. So I achieve my number. So this is the kind of thing normally typically we all face. So the sourcing team also is getting more accurate data so that the sourcing also happens. So in a way inventory health for the overall company is improving. So this is how we try to do the uh, integration plus we also have something called where we take material from our vendors. So what we do, we also implement a vendor portal. So from through that what we have done, we have also digitized our vendor side of it because vendor also, you see they have something they will try to run their uh, shift or they will try lot of change they will not encourage because that adds to the cost. So now with this we are also giving to the vendor the exact inventory what we want as an organization. So we digitize from vendor, that is from through vendor portal, from vendor till our raw material procurement till our production uh, scheduling, so with SNOP process and all you can do MRP planning, DRP planning, uh, all those things you can do which is all totally digitized and now see again in logistics if you see this is the entire supply chain inventory movement we do and on the other side we also digitize our transport management system where we have implemented DMS plus WMS is already there so with that if you see if you see the entire thing which I explained with that you are getting visibility in all the aspects whether it is inventory lying at the vendor, whether inventory at the production, what is going to happen, inventory what is lying at my dealer's place, inventory what is lying in my warehouses. So with this, actually we have been able to a lot of our inventory carrying cost, so which again adds to the bottom line. Okay. Similarly, in terms of visibility, transport through transport management system and WMS, what we have been able to do, we know, we have got the visibility, my which truck is lying where, what time it is going to come, so and what time my dealer is going to get the delivery. So all those things that we have also digitized. So this entire process, if you see, we have done end to end. And that is giving benefits in terms of we can take faster action because you know things are changing. And in Corona also taught us that many companies were struggling post-corona. Because Corona actually a lot of inventory we had which we could not sell because the market was shut. And so people become very defensive. So they, uh, next two, three months, many companies they did not go for production itself. So whatever inventory was there, they were trying to liquidate. Then what happened when the suddenly the market picked up, they were not even able to ramp up the production to that level where I think they could get, catch the market. So with this digitization process, at least we were in a better position to, it was like a when to switch on the button and when to switch off the button. So we were in a very much better position by doing this. So I believe digitization in a way is helping us in taking the right decision and we are more equipped to face the book out. That's what I said. Thank you. I think uh, with uh, all uh, digital journey of each and every organization, uh, we are able to you know, unlock a lot of value for, uh, for individual organizations, be it top end, be it bottom line, be it money invested in inventory or health of investment. Uh, uh, health of inventory or rack of etc. reduction rack of uh, so these are some of the values which are very well known to us uh, but I would like to invite Samrat here that uh, if we can put uh, uh, how we can use uh, different uh, digital tools for to unlock other dimension of the supply chain right. so good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, I think uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this esteemed panel I am travelling to Mumbai almost after two and a half years. So it was giving me goosebumps in the morning when I landed actually. And great to be a part of you know, uh, this wonderful forum, uh, great audience which we have here. So coming to this point, uh, you know, basically uh, one of course we have all, all talked about is the efficiency which we have to drive uh, and you know uh, how digitization is actually helping the organization to drive efficiency. But there are many other dimensions also which are part of, uh, you know, uh, you know which, which are basically the driving force behind digitization. So I think I can divide this whole thing into four parts. You know, first is of course the most important thing for any organization which is service. So customer is the center point killer. And service 
basically means that how you are able to reach the customer on time every time we demand for product. So you are able to uh, provide a particular service level to the, the sales team or to the customer. The service level could be different for different organizations. It could be say an FMCG company would want to operate at a 99% service level. Uh, maybe a uh, uh, LNG kind of an organization where customer may be, may be willing to you know wait for the product, their service level could be slightly different. So driving service level for certain organizations is very, very important and hence they need end-to-end -end visibility of the inventory which is lying in the system. When I say end-to-end -end inventory, it doesn't only mean the finished goods inventory which is available to promise to a customer, but it also means what is under production, what can be produced in the next maybe two or three weeks, and what is on the seat probably, which probably will connect to you. So you want to have an end-to-end -end visibility not for maybe next two weeks, you want end-to-end visibility for six months, probably, so that you are able to drive actions within the organization, which are the products which you want to push more, which are the products where the demand is coming higher, and you want to maybe, you know, tone down, because you may not be able to meet the demand because of whatever fluctuations are happening in the market. So service is one aspect of this. And technology is helping in many other ways also in improving the service. So I'll give you very small examples. For example, uh, you know, AI implementation in warehouse. So you want to ensure that every time you are dispatching the goods uh, to your uh, distributor, you know, the count of the goods is absolutely accurate. So you can actually look at what technology you can uh, you know, uh, deploy there. Because today it is a very, very manual, people-intensive job of picking up the goods and you know, bringing up to the uh, you know, loading bay and uh, loading it into the truck and dispatching. In this exercise, many times the counting uh, becomes an issue and you know, uh, wrong dispatches happen. So, we are actually, you know, currently uh, experimenting with certain technologies which can, which can help us to basically reduce these errors. Similarly, in service, you can also look at basically how, uh, you know, your layoffs, uptime can be increased. So, for example, every quarter, all our warehouses have to have one audit uh, in which you know complete cycle count is done, all the inventory is counted once. During this period, the warehouse will shut for two or three days, depending on how big the warehouse is. We are actually experimenting with technologies which can, which can help you automate this process. It will not be a manual count which you will be doing, but technology is available, they will be able to quickly count which product, how much quantity is available. It is under experiment stage. Apart from this, then you know it's all about efficiency. So in efficiency, we have talked about how uh, your total delivered cost can be controlled. But efficiency is also coming in some other ways. Uh, so you know, if I have to give you an example, I think some of us have talked about it, but maybe loadability of how much uh, you know you're loading in every truck. You know that is loadability. So digitization of the whole pro uh, you know pro process of loadability and uh, truck planning is one aspect. Route planning for your secondary distribution, this is the, the other aspect uh, way which helps you in uh, achieving efficiency. Then we go to you know completely different dimensions of say sustainability. So that is a big challenge. You know today, uh, Dabur is a food product uh, company also. So you know almost one fourth of our, our turnover is coming to food products. And customers' relationship with food has you know completely changed over the last few years. What does that mean? That essentially means that earlier the requirement was only you know basic hygiene. If it is available in the product, you know people used to uh, typically buy the product. But today, what we see is that uh, the customer is becoming more demanding. Customer wants to know the source of the product, from where it is coming, whether it is through sustainable means. So this actually throws a completely new dimension for the supply chain. You need to really track the product. You have to ensure that there is safe sourcing of the product which is happening, there is safe manufacturing which is there, there is safe transportation of the product under temperature control many a times. So all these aspects, you know, digitization is actually driving us to ensure that we are able to meet, meet all these requirements of, uh, you know, the customer. And finally, essentially, if I talk about, you know, it's also the compliance piece. And when I talk about compliance, it means Basically, how uh, you know compliance is not only government regulations. You put compliance on your so there is a compliance uh, expectation from the customer side. So, so this whole piece is also actually uh, you know digitization is actually driving this whole piece as well.
So these are the various other uh, para, uh, you know, dimensions uh, which have been driven through uh, you know, digitalization. Uh, thanks, Amrat. I think uh, we had hired us also a large portfolio of the food and just taking your point forward, uh, we have a gold supply chain. So in, in each of our CFAs, uh, there are gold rooms and yeah. our uh, uh, part of our product moves by a gold supply chain where temperature ranging between say 4 to 8 degrees every second. So how digital is access is each vehicle has uh, real-time temperature monitoring data and that goes uh, to the cloud. And anybody, so earlier it was there, it was coming as a low at the end of the journey, but now it has become real-time. So I think some of these improvement, uh, improvements are helping customers in terms of, uh, you know, getting the product every time right in the fridge. But in fact, in fact, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought I'll put a spanner in the wheel now. So good free flow discussion, the need of digitalization has been identified, etc. Since the last two years we have been on the journey of digitalization, not only uh, in the office but probably at home also a lot of things are getting digitalized in the flow of events, the way it happens in the society, so this way, even the schooling, admission processes, etc. Now, uh, you know the very important element is who should invest in the digitalization process? And especially when there are two organizations are talking to each other. Especially, uh, see, two scenarios are there. One is a very static environment, which is probably a manufacturing retail or FMCG or consumer goods operating, where if you have a good set of manufacturing locations, good distributors, number of distributors, all everything is almost with the dealer, distributor, customer outlet, etc. etc. And you have to the last point is identify. But then there are environment for the especially for the engineering goods companies. And they are also significantly large in terms of the, the contribution to the GDP and as well as the huge uh, chunk of rate cost they bear on their shoulders. Like probably for us, it's almost more than 800 million dollars kind of a rate expenditure which we bear on our balance sheet. So for us, it becomes important to have the, the, the visibility of the shipment. And to have that visibility of the shipments, uh, be it all shipping lines, be it CMA, CGM or MSC or Kinaragal or DHL, everyone has their own best in class system in place. But what they want, or maybe airlines, if you call it MPS, Lutansa, or anyone who is having the global uh, air cargo movement, or the transportation, DHL supply chain, etc. But the real problem is with the shipper, or maybe the, as a user, they all want you to log into their system and track it in. You understand what I'm talking about? I'll, I'll answer this question. So, so this is the challenge. Yeah, typically we want for the cost efficiency our transportation partners uh, independent, right? Because otherwise if you are locked into the partner then cost efficiency will not exactly. come. And what we have done is we have invested in interfaces. So irrespective of my old transportation partner, the data goes in the interface and automatically get converted into the common standard data. So we can look from, from this perspective. Yeah, well, actually I just wanted to add to what Sonat was saying. See, what we have that typically we are into consumer global and we have something called where you have warranty, guarantee, all those stuffs are there. So what we have done, we have barcoded each and every of our product. So all my product today are scanned in, in the warehouse and scanned out at the time of sale. So by this scanning, what also we have achieved is that cross selling that normally happens. This region material going to that region. That has stopped. Plus this counterfeiting. That like counterfeit has totally stopped. Plus when I am getting any material for replacement, so I know the entire history of the product. Where it was sold, to whom it was sold, and whether this product is actually under warranty or whether it is which is a can warranty can be given or not given. So entire thing we have been able to do through this digitization. Then if I put FMCG uh, in the link to it, even many times callbacks can be addressed very well whether it is from distributor or customer. So I think a lot of uh, dimensions. Uh, my question to Samran to you is, uh, uh, you know there are different technology partners for uh, different facets of supply chain. So what are the criteria when you select particular partner or particular, you know, enabler, if I say? Yeah, so I think uh, this is a very deep question and this challenge comes to us uh, as supply chain leaders every day. Uh, and you know, to uh, answer this question, I think we will have to step back and see why what is driving the 
the time future. So, so FMCG companies typically always keep talking about the customer and you know customer is the king, customer is the center point. So for us, what we see is that you know, with whatever advancements are happening today, customer is actually able to transfer funds to the organization. He is able to pay cash to at the speed of light. That's the way it is happening. So what happens with this is that there is an expectation which comes from the customer that we should be able to deliver the product at the speed of light. Because he is able to give you cash, so he is expecting the same problem. So what happens with this is that you know the brands or the organizations are no more competing with each other. It is the supply chains which start competing with each other. And today we see that companies or the brands, they are no more competing. Companies which are actually doing well are the ones where the supply chains are better equipped to deal with the customer requirement. So what does, what does this mean? This means that supply chain has to become a core competence for any organization which wants to actually do well. And when any organization wants to do well and supply chain has to become a core competence, then digitization is the enabler which will make sure that supply chain becomes the core competence. And hence, there is investment which is bound to happen behind supply chain. Now, organizations typically used to earlier ask for the ROI. That ROI model is already out of the window. There is a different R. There are three different R's which the organization is today asking for. What are, what are those R's? The first is resilience. So, and the second is basically relevance. And third is responsibility. These are the three R's which the organizations or the CEOs are looking for. Now, what do you mean by, uh, you know, resilience? Resilience essentially means your ability to stand back whenever there is, you know, uh, any disruption in the supply chain. So, disruptions we have seen, geopolitical disruptions, we have seen climatic disruptions, and recently everyone has gone through the pandemic. So, if the organization supply chain is resilient, means it will be able to stand up quickly in the face of all, you know, these kind of disruptions. What is relevance? Relevance is flexibility of the supply chain to be able to meet the customer requirement. Also means efficiency. You should be able to drive efficiency within the supply chain so that you are able to save the money and put behind the brands, put investment back into the organization. So this is relevance. <coughs> and third is of, of, of course responsibility to want to pick up sustainable supply chain. So these are the three criteria which you have to fulfill whenever you are actually investing in digitalization. This should be the guiding force for you. These three criteria should be the guiding force. Now parallelly, what is also happening is a wonderful thing. There are a lot of startups which have come in the space of digitalization. So smart people, many of them, you know, I have met in the morning, many of you are there in this room as well. You know, startups which are able to, you know, provide small, uh, islands of digitization, plug and play is available, cost is very very less, they will not charge you for POC or very less cost for POC. What does this mean? You run multiple projects within your supply chain because you do not have to commit any investment upfront. Whenever a project is successful, you are actually scaling up to decide okay this project is successful, good for the organization, I will put money behind this project. And that is how you are deciding. So three hours you are fulfilling and then whichever project is succeeding you actually put money. Now for Dabar we are doing digitization in many areas. Well, if I have to talk about six, seven top areas in which we are doing digitization. You know first and foremost is of course cash management. You know earlier uh, there were certain customers of ours who were actually digitized in cash management. We were able to get money like that but Many customers and definitely our last five connectivity, a lot of collection was hard cash. So we are actually moving to digital mode there. Then we are of course in planning and distribution, we are digitizing the supply chain. Uh, you know primary transportation, we go nine yards of primary transportation right from drug calling, uh, drug loadability uh, and then monitoring the drug all throughout the transit right up to the delivery. It helps us in the planning, complete planning of the warehouse space as well. Because you get advanced information that in three days time the truck is going to reach the warehouse. Two days now, day, six hours, 
That's how the you know, warehouse team is able to plan the things. It's how I am going to get five trucks. I have to unload them in time. So you know, all that planning is happening. So many areas actually in which you know, digitalization is helping us. I think in the end, uh, you know, I I am reborn. Uh, you know, I am reminded of uh, one saying of Charles Darwin. He said that the the species which is going to you know uh, survive is is not going to be the uh, the most intelligent species, but probably you know the one which is which will be able to actually adapt to change. And if he will be talking, you know, if he was there alive today also, if he were he would have given this. Uh, saying for organizations, he would have said that organizations which are able to adapt to change uh, would be the ones which will be able to survive. And uh, what is something which will be able to help the organization to survive the change is actually digitalization. And that's why I think uh, uh, we all know AI and ML is the backbone of uh, all the digital transformation, and we have a couple of partners very exciting between the companies and. Uh, let's hear from them how these uh, cognitive technologies are embedding in the overall world digital transformation. So, uh, if we want to begin and then talk about it. Thanks, uh, thanks, and great to be part of this uh, exciting panel and incredible audience. Uh, I represent a company called MapMind, and it's a public place on. Uh, most of us, when we think of maps or location, we think of one app in our phone, but there is a homegrown Indian company that all of us should be proud of that has thrived and survived and also you know brought all this uh, learning and technology that you build right here in India to Indian uh, you know the Indian economy and also Indian industry. We are uh, all proud of you. We are right? all very very proud of you. And uh, there is a consumer app that you guys can download. Uh, it's an alternate to Google Maps. Uh, we call it Maples. Uh, and it's yeah. growing in usage by a very uh, fast uh, amount. If you guys participate in the Hyper Tehanga challenge and did the digital flag hoisting, we kind of enabled that whole system for, for the entire country. And I think some of these initiatives are exciting. Um, I also want to add to what, uh, what was said here that uh, what you just said when you finished up that adaptability and uh, adaptability to change is the biggest thing for not only businesses but individuals. As we learned through 2020 as the pandemic came in, because all of us uh, survived through the pandemic, and the only thing that helped is, you know, uh, just changing ourselves, literally next day. Uh, and the same thing in our business is to, uh, very rightly said, through using digital technologies. Uh, and all of AI, ML, all of this might sound very complicated, but companies like us are here to simplify it uh, and just make it a simple plug or a simple button. That industry and uh, you know companies can use. So it's, the key from AI um, it is a, basically it's a combination of the core of data, petabytes of data, with a very simple insight. Typically, uh, companies that can do that help industries very well. Uh, and that petabytes of data in our case, which is a very core component to uh, propelling the industry forward, is real world data. Real world data includes what is the traffic on any large or what is the traffic on the Nexus highway right now, uh, what is the weather predictably tomorrow, today, next week, next month, uh, and, and so on and so forth. All of these data points as they come together, uh, they need to help better predictive planning and therefore better scheduling and better you know efficiency in the future. Um, and that's what we do as a company. And we bring all this information, whether it's, you know, like I mentioned, uh, it could also be used for, uh, like right now, what I can tell you is we work with all the large e-commerce companies. And as e-commerce companies evolve, they essentially, initially as a startup stage, they have the uh, supply chain outsourced. And all of their vision is to, you know, get the supply chain in source, which is to build their own supply chain networks. And that's and the reason they do that is because that's their biggest competitive edge. Uh, because not the, not the app, not the face, that technology has kind of been uh, more and more, I would say, uh, commoditized. The main uh, difference we've seen as we talk to their leaders, and we have also Flipkart invested in our company and the minority stake uh, long back in 2015. The main difference was, are they able to predictably deliver to their customers uh, in the SLA this and as you see today, the SLAs are going smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? Uh, there are companies that do 10 minute delivery. Is that a They are um, like Mumbai or micro based company. And 10 minute delivery, you know, like half an hour delivery, same day delivery, all of 
this only can happen if you know what's happening in the real world. Right? So fundamentally, uh, for us as a company, uh, we know that as the delivery time gets lesser, the utilization of maps and location like really shoots through. Because if I need to make a 10 minute delivery to you, I really need to know should I, can I send a cycle that, you know, <laughs> that goes or a bike that goes you know, on the wrong side of the road or how can I reach you in 10 minutes and how do I place my dark store or depot or mini depot around that location. So the utilization of maps and uh, location that explodes as the, uh, you know, as the delivery time uh, goes lesser and consumer expectations are very high, I'm sure all of you the way our money is transferred right now has changed from 2017 to now. It literally that you can send money in one second if you expect a delivery that you said in one second. Uh, and that is going to come in. And uh, more different forms of transportation, like we've done pilots, we've, we've also got global. So you've seen different parts of the world there are pilots who make drone delivery. And drone delivery needs maps of the skies. Uh, and some of you might imagine that you, know, you actually need 3D, 3D data which tells you that you know, I can actually drop a package of the building or drop, drop a package at a particular site and someone can actually pick it up. So all of this data information you know, is in the context of AI that helps uh, one is relatively plan better, like where to put up your warehouse, where to put up your depots. And second, to life track, make, make sense of the information, basically you know, plan which loops and sequences you operate. So that's, uh, I think we are kind of running out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Ankit. I think uh, we all, as a consumer, love shorter delivery time. We, you know, earlier Monday delivery of Amazon or then uh, delivery of Fat or Swiggy and stuff. But we all, as a supply chain guy, hate the time set because we are in a perennial treadmill. Uh, and while uh, Ankit talk about a lot of external data mapping and the engineering that is the supply chain, uh, I think that means last word from you on using AI in, in, in internal within organization. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, like Ankit said, no, AI is, is a big part of uh, uh, It's actually an extension of the data topic that we spoke about, but ultimately it's all about data, right? Uh, even internally, you know, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, machine maintenance or whether in terms of, you know, understanding the uh, you know, uh, semi finished goods movement, so a lot of technologies are coming up in terms of, you know, uh, how it, it delivers is great analytics in terms of, for example, we have customers where you know there's dashboards which tells them when is the next machine maintenance due, you know, based on the usage and based on stress on the machine, and actually give them great analytics. So these are kinds of you know, it goes into very detail in terms of how uh, you know uh, uh, you can actually use this uh, AI ML capability in terms of you know uh, handling uh, uh, your efficient supply chain. Now to just add that, I want uh, to one more point, which is uh, the extension of AI is called NLP, National uh, Natural Language Processing. So that has become very powerful now as well, especially for consumer goods companies, where you know you can actually, you know, social media has been a big part, whether it's Twitter, Insta, or whatever, right? So you need, uh, there are these tools available where actually you can listen to social media and actually drive, drive to, you know, uh, changes in supply chain. Uh, we have a case study where uh, one of our cosmetic company uh, clients, you know, you know, Kim Kardashian, she's a celebrity in the US. She did uh, put an Instagram post saying, I use this product to actually remove a scar from my son's face. And immediately it was uh, retweeted, I mean, re shared like 100,000 times and retweeted and all that, right? So immediately this NLP, uh, the uh, language processing part, it actually picks up these signals on positive sentiment, negative sentiment, and then it attacks the supply chain, rebalances it. Immediately it says, okay, I need to actually focus production on this particular product because this is a lot of noise coming. So you need your entire production plan change. So these are kind of things that you know that's getting you. One more part is the sales breakdown, where not just you know uh, uh, your forecasting, but internally you are actually telling your sales people what is your predicted sales going to be in next uh, one week or two weeks, very near term. What about know, demand sense and demand chain as well? So a lot of these things are happening. Uh, again, the time running out, you know, we will not know detail, but you know I think the uh, the power is limitless. I think uh, we have for some exciting times in terms of you know uh, using this uh, new age tech and a simple fact that I've been and you know making sure we use that for our supply chain initiative. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we are all open to take some questions and very very uh, different learn people of different industries. So anyone?
this is given. Uh, so I come from a company called Critical of India Private Limited. So we are a small scale company, you, can, you could say. So uh, I was hearing to Mr. Samrat saying that uh, they use digitalization in various verticals across their company. So uh, as far as a big company like Dabar is concerned, they have that cash flow management or they have a need uh, in each and every company. But when it comes to small companies, say 50 crore, 100 crore, say 200 crore company. So how do these companies focus, whether on which vertical they should focus on digitalization first? Because small companies cannot put money in each and every vertical for digitalization, right? So what is it that they should focus? So I think, uh, you know, I like not work in small companies, uh, so but I can definitely, I have given the guiding principle which are the three R's which you have focused on. Uh, this is one, you know, guiding force which will apply not only to big companies but any size company. So you have to look at resilience. Uh, in resilience it means for a small company, what are the problem areas which are there which you feel that, uh, you know, whenever there could be any disruption, you know, could impact that organization in which particular area and you try to digitize that means. Similarly, relevance. So, what aspect of relevance you want to attack first, whether it is the cost, you want to attack cost, then you want to attack service first, you have to decide this is that right. Then, of course, is responsibility. I think whether you are small or large, responsibility is something which will be applying to you always. You have to, you have to choose between these three. Uh, Two more aspects which you have to you know, also consider digitization, whether it is the startups which I was also alluding to. You know, there are a lot of startups which are actually able to give you some uh, plug and play, uh, you know, small pieces of digitization uh, at very low cost. So, whether it is a large organization or small organization, uh, startups will be able to support at a low cost. Secondly, even if you look at large organizations like you know, SAP of the world or Oracle of the world, they also have preferential pricing for small organizations. So a similar, you know, a big tool of IDP for maybe uh, SAP IDP is there, if it is there for a big organization, similar kind of a toned down version of uh, that tool could be there, even for smaller organizations. And they have for the same tool also preferential pricing for number of users or the kind of turnover which organization has. So you can actually prioritize this is the three hours and then decide which tool you want to do. But there will be uh, partners available of all kind which will be able to support you at the cost uh, structures which you want to, uh, which you can afford. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Justice, if I am the only one whom you know you are asking the question, you have to ask all six of them. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Abhinav. I work for a uh, D2C uh, firm, Love Goodness. Uh, we are a cosmetic startup. So it was interesting to hear from Samrat sir that even a company like Dabba will face. Uh, issues of you know uh, uh, wrong dispatches or uh, different quantities of goods going out in mismatching uh, dispatches. So my question is to uh, like uh, all of you that although we talk about AI, ML, and digitization in uh, forums like these, uh, as uh, sir mentioned in uh, regarding L and D uh, and the you know there are places where the uh, data capturing and that digital interfaces has not reached the it's very nascent level. So where is this point where both the digital AI ML uh, softwares and the ground level physical inventory, physical movement should uh, marry or you know, uh, how, what do, what do you think, like where is that point in future when we will be, you know, at a more advanced stage uh, of these things getting streamlined. Like there are many small startups where which are giving this plug and play softwares and we are having that uh, those things at the planning stage. 
But in the execution stage, we are uh, still lacking is what my limited understanding tells me. If you know some more light can be shared on that, that at the execution stage, what are the digital uh, tools or digital technologies which are uh, currently there for you know optimizing our projects? So actually, if I have a question, I have all these things which I have about, and there are a little more also than this also. So, for example, bots in order processing. Uh, and uh, any other technologies, we are actually experimenting with them. Now your question, when will they become, probably you are asking when they will they scale up. You know, so that, you know, the, the good part about start startups, what I talk about is that low no cost, plug and play. At the same time, they are also experimenting. And uh, we are giving them platform, or organizations are giving them platform to actually sharpen their pencils and you know, come up with technologies which eventually will save up. Now, uh, you see that over the last two years, uh, especially after the pandemic, a lot of these startups are also coming in, but companies are also willing to experiment. Earlier, the implementations which at least I used to look at were you know, large scale implementations, big companies, big software providers used to experiment only with them. So, all the SFPs and Oracles of the world, we go to them and we go to them. But now, uh, because of the need, understanding that digitization is an imperative, it is no more a fancy term, but it is a matter of survival now, uh, organizations are willing to experiment. And uh, I think you will see, if, if we have to give a time frame, I think anywhere between next uh, three to five years, you will see a lot of these technologies will get scaled up in a big way. But right now you are right that experiment is happening and some of these technologies, for example, I am talking about bot in order processing. That is something which we have scaled up uh, over the last uh, one and a half years in a big way. So I think when you are talking about like capturing of data fundamentally uh, at the ground level, um, there are multiple sensors that multiple parts of the chain I mean, already existing have or need to be attached. For example, from, uh, from a truck perspective, there needs to be a uh, sensor attached and that captures location and that captures movement and data. Like if it's a freezer, then it captures the temperature. If it's a, you know, there are multiple things. If it's a, uh, it's a different type of vehicle, then it can capture so much more data. Right? That it's basically telemetry data. That, that's one. When you attach sensors onto, uh, you know, a vehicle, or you can attach it within the, you know, within the warehouse of the plant itself, you can have in plant basically sensors. So that is one. As you attach those sensors, you capture more data. Right? And that obviously goes into, like you said, there are many companies that are doing AI and you know analytics and they give you the output that what should be what should look like. Second is everyone in the part of the uh, chain already people have phones with them. Phones capture a ton of data right now. Like uh, and they I think they're very utilized. They can utilize five percent of it in an enterprise. So phones have Camera, cameras, they have location, they have movement sensors. A lot of that can also be fundamentally be utilized in the, in the future. They are being utilized in small ways like POD, EPOD and all that. But there is a lot more application of it. Um, and that, that, so basically fundamentally there is this very two simple points and there are many more other points but I am just telling you that you know, attachment of sensors onto the network and utilizing existing you know, like devices like phones or anything that is given. In. So that's that's fundamentally where data is getting captured right now. We'll continue to use it. Yeah, like I, to add to that, you were asking about how to digitize the inventory part. So we have already done that digitization of the inventory through QR code. So we have this, uh, our all our products are having QR code. And with that QR code, we are able to manage repo. We are able to manage the aging of the inventory. We are able to manage the guarantee and warranty part of that inventory. So all these things we are able to manage only by a simple QR code, which is being pressure at the time of production. So with that we are able to manage the entire movement. So if any stock is there in any dealer location or any location, with a simple phone scanner, you scan it and you can get most of the basic data. So that is how we are able to digitize our inventory also. And with that, the best thing that has happened, like inventory accuracy in my 32 warehouses is 100%. There is not even a mismatch, not even a color mismatch. Because what we have done at the time of when the quick slip is getting generated, that quick slip data is flowing into the handle of the guy who is going to pick the material. So when he is going to pick the material, he has to scan. 
and when the scan, when the uh, line mentioned or the item mentioned on the click slip and what is scanning, if there is a mismatch, he will not be able to proceed further. So it will be a stoppage there. So by default, all the right product only he will be able to send. So that is how we have that. So we have done that digitization of this inventory in our organization. So sorry, we're completely out of time. Everyone's going to complain that I couldn't give them time for lunch, so, so I'm very sorry about that, but that's okay. So I'm going to request you please connect to our speakers offline. Would that be okay? Super. So, Mr. Manoj, on that note, shall we call it a wrap then? Great. So with that, firstly, can we have a round of applause to thank all of our speakers. And I'd also like to request our session moderator, Mr. Manoj, to please present uh, a token of gratitude to all of your speakers. First up, to Mr. Ankit Bhatt. To Mr. Samrat Sagal. To Mr. Dharmin Dragandrade. To Mr. Sheikh Asad Parvez. To Mr. Anirudha Karnataki. And to Mr. Ashit V. Hegde. And I'd like to do the honors of presenting the token of gratitude to Mr. Manoj Kotari. Schedule break is for 40 minutes. I'm sure it'll get extended to 45, 15 minutes as well. Because that's what happens in lunch. We're going to have all the conversations. But please do note, after lunch, we also have parallel tracks taking place. So do take a look at the agenda. And we'll come back over here for the leadership track when we talk about winning in the turn. So that's going to be the next session taking place here. Please enjoy your lunch. Please take care of your belongings. And see you all uh, in the next 45 minutes. Thank you.